All right. We're going to start looking at the book of Genesis. And I know a lot of you guys are going, yay, more in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is important. So the reason we're going to be in Genesis, and I think I mentioned it last week, uh, is that we're going to specifically just go through Genesis, not verse by verse or chapter by chapter, but just looking at, um, at where we can see Christ in the book of Genesis. Um, so turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 5, and we'll see why Genesis and, entire, and the entirety of the Old Testament is important. John chapter 5. So this is an interaction or interchange between Jesus and the, the Pharisees, the religious leadership of the nation of Israel. And if you look down in verse 37 and following, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Then look in verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my word? If you recall, on the road to Damascus, Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his two apostles, or two, two disciples, and eventually he sets down and he takes them, beginning with Moses, he takes them through the scriptures, the entirety of the scriptures, to show the things that were written about himself. So, when we say that Jesus is all through the Old Testament, that's not something that we made up. That's what Jesus himself taught. He taught to the Pharisees, and he taught to his own disciples. So, if that is the case, then we need to be familiar with that. Now, what is it about Genesis specifically? And we're not going to have a, a deep and long lesson tonight. We're just going to do an overview. We're going to talk about Genesis, and we're going to just do an overview, maybe... Um, if you know what a survey is, we're going to take a survey of Gen Genesis this week as an introduction, and we'll drill down on some specific passages in the coming weeks. But what is it about Genesis that is so important? Because Genesis is a foundational book in our faith. Genesis tells us why we are here, right? You know, that, that famous question, what, what, why do we exist? Why do I exist? Well, you find that in Genesis. You also find in Genesis the, the reason that we ha face trouble, the reason that we have death and sorrow and pain and sickness. We, we talk, so we have creation, we have the fall, and then we have the first indication of the solution. Genesis is divided into two basic parts. The first 11 chapters are talking about the history of man. Right, So we begin with creation, then we have the fall, then we have Cain and Abel, then we have uh, the flood, and so on and so forth. Beginning in chapter 12 through chapter 50, there are 50 chapters in Genesis, it's all about the nation of Israel, the beginning of the nation of Israel. So chapter 12 starts with us being introduced to Abram, who later becomes Abraham. And so we have the patriarchs. We have Abraham, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. And he has the 12 sons. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. And Genesis uh, closes with the story of Joseph. And in my opinion, Joseph is probably, uh, well, I said my opinion, so I'm going to take the probably out. In my opinion, Joseph is the clearest example of a type or a shadow in that we have in the Old Testament about Christ. There are so many parallels in the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus that Joseph, Joseph's life if you look at it in totality and follow the timeline, you see he is prefiguring everything basically that Jesus would do. So when we get to Joseph, we're really going to drill down and think about some of these things. But um, we have types in here of Christ. We have shadows in here of Christ. And we have some pre-incarnate appearances or, or theophanies 
or Christophanies, some people talking. Pre-incarnate simply means that an appearance of Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem, before he comes in his incarnation. So we have it when he meets Mo, when he meets Abraham, and he's, and he's on his way to go destroy Lot, I mean destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and rescue Lot. Uh, we have him in Genesis. We have him when he wrestles with Jacob, right? When and we have him when Jacob dream. We have him a few different pre-incarnate appearances. So Christ appears in in the book of Genesis, as we'll see as we go through. But let's just go ahead. Any questions so far on what Genesis is and what Genesis can do for us? And I know there's a lot of young young Christians out here that probably has not spent a lot of time in the book of Genesis. Um, luckily, growing up. My Sunday school teachers taught a whole lot of stories out of the book of Genesis. So I was fairly settled in the book of Genesis growing up. But I know many have not been. But Genesis is a very, very important book for the Christian and for a believer. The very first verse in the Bible is the ultimate foundational verse in the entire scripture. Because if you can believe what Genesis 1-1 says, nothing else in the Bible is surprising. Genesis 1-1 one, one is, the, is the pivotal verse for us to have a true understanding and belief in God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we understand and believe and can get our heads around that, then nothing else he does throughout the rest of the scriptures should be a surprise. When Jesus walks on water, it shouldn't be a surprise. Why? Because in the beginning, he spoke the world into existence. In the beginning, and John tells us in his gospel that the creative agent of the Godhead was Jesus. In him was everything, and that by him and through him was everything made. Everything. So when God said, let there be light, later on in Genesis 1, that comes out of Jesus' mouth. Jesus speaks those words. So Jesus was the creative agent of the Godhead who spoke creation into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if we can believe that, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, when he heals somebody uh, born blind, when he does all of these things, when God parts the Red Sea, when the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt, none of those things are surprising. None of the miraculous that follows in the rest of the scriptures are surprising if you can get your head around Genesis 1-1. It's the most important verse in the Bible for you to get your mind around and understand and believe because Everything else is, is lesser than that in the grand scheme of things. So chapter one, we have the creation of the world. The end of chapter one, God creates man. Chapter two, we have the institution of the Sabbath and then a more detailed look at the creation of mankind. So, <coughs> excuse me, day six, he creates Adam. And in, day, uh, and in chapter two, uh, we go back and look at that more in detail. So there's two, two accounts of the creation of man. Chapter 1 is just a brief account. Chapter 2 is the more full account. Then chapter 3, we have the record of the fall. And that's when Adam and Eve took of the fruit, the forbidden fruit. And I know I've mentioned this from the pulpit a few times, so let's just look at it fairly briefly. But this is the first messianic prophecy in the Bible, is Genesis chapter 3. Because after the fall, right, Adam and Eve go to the number one. God created man and woman and set them in the midst of the garden. The garden was huge. If you look at the dimensions on it that the Bible gives us, it's a huge place. He says, you can eat of the fruit of any other tree. You can eat of the fruit of any plant in the whole garden except one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You may not eat that. Now, why does God put that in the garden to start with? In order for mankind to have a relationship with him, with him, we must have a choice. He could have made Adam and Eve there and not given them the option to fall, but then that wouldn't have been a true relationship. Right? He created mankind to have a relationship with him. That's what you find your purpose is when you look at Genesis 2. 
right? We're created to have a relationship with our creator. And we cannot have a re relationship with our creator unless we have a choice. Then we would be robots, and that's not a relationship. So that's why, number one, the tree's in the garden. They go to the, the very place where the tree is. So you have to ask yourself, why would they be in the very location of the tree? They've got thousands of square miles to go to wander in the garden. And yet they're at the very tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? That's they're just like toddlers. We've all had toddlers, most of us. And when you tell a toddler don't go in the street, what do they do? They get as absolutely close to the street as they can possibly get. Right? They want to get right up into to the edge. And that's what Adam and Eve are doing. They're getting right up to the edge of what they were allowed to do. And when we do that, and we all have a tendency to do that, we get right up into the edge where we think, okay, I can go this far, and I want to see how close I can get to the edge without going over. And that's when we begin to get in trouble in our spiritual life. But that's another lesson for another day. So they're, they're somewhere they should not have been. The serpent is there, and the serpent tempts Eve, and Eve takes and eats the fruit and gives some to her husband who was with her. Adam was right there with Eve. That's what it says there in chapter 3. So it's not like she had to take the fruit back to the camp. Adam's standing there watching this whole transaction go on. This is why sin enters through Adam and not through Eve. Adam's responsibility was for his wife to care for her and protect her. And instead, he's using her as a guinea pig. So, ladies, don't let your man tell you that it was Eve that allowed sin to come into the world. It was the failure of the man that allowed sin to come into the world. That's why the scripture is consistent the whole time. Sin entered through Adam, not through Eve, because Adam was right there with her. And then we have the, the God coming through in verse, verse 8. They hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God from among the trees of the garden. And God calls to them, where are you? And we're hiding because we're naked. God says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit? And of course, they ate of the fruit. And then we have God cursing the serpent and in God cursing uh, mankind and womankind. But the verses I want you to look at is verse 15, because this is the first messianic prophecy in the Bible. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Offspring in the Hebrew is seed, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, Jennifer's a nurse. I was a biology major for a time. We all, and most of us understand, it takes two to make a baby. It takes a man and a woman, right? It takes a female egg, it takes a male sperm. What this is saying is, it's not the seed of the man who's going to crush your head. It's the seed of the woman. It's a prophecy of the virgin birth. God will take what was coming from a woman to destroy Satan, right? It's a prophecy of the coming Messiah and that God and his promised Messiah will be a virgin born child who would destroy Satan. In the meantime, Satan will be able to bruise his heel. Satan will be able to harm him, but ultimate victory belonged to the seed of the woman. So that's the very first time we see a promise of the Messiah is a promise of a virgin birth and ultimate victory, and it's in Genesis chapter 3. <coughs> then we have an introduction in chapter 3 to the means of salvation, and it's a, it's a shadow. It's a shadow type of the salvation. Uh, he just has just cursed Eve and said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. You look at the underlying language. This is why a lot of women have a whole difficulty when the scripture says, submit to your husbands. It's part of the fall. Because man and woman were created to be in harmony, both in their place within the relationship. And that relationship was to model the relationship between God and his people. And so as the people were supposed to be subordinate to God, the woman was created to be subordinate to, to man. Well, sin changed that dynamic. And the underlying Hebrew language here is your desire will be to rule your husband. Right? Which I don't blame most of you. 
I don't blame Cheryl sometimes because men are just as fallen, if not more so, because sin entered through Adam. So if we could be perfect and be godly like we're supposed to, then everything would fall into place. And to Adam, he said, because you have not listened to the voice, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you in pain. You shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife Eve because she is the mother of all living and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. This is an indication of what it took to bring that relationship right back into place, right? They have recognized their naked and that's symbolic of they have recognized their sinfulness. They are no longer worthy to walk with God in the cool of the evening because sin has separated them. They have seen their, e their own evil compared to God and now they cannot come into God's presence, right? That was the whole thing. They're hiding from God. And so the solution that God gives is not to just whip up magically some clothes. No, he takes an innocent animal, and my guess would be it would be a lamb, and he slaughters the lamb right there in front of them, and he makes clothes out of the skin of the lamb. Out of that blood sacrifice, the innocent animal that God sacrificed is what he clothes Adam and Eve with to hide their nakedness. Nakedness stands for sin, right? I mean, it's not primarily a passage about nudist or nudism. It's a passage about sin. Their nakedness stood for their sinfulness. So how does God cover their sinfulness? It's with an innocent sacrifice. So he's telling them right up front, look, this is the only way that you can now come into my presence is if you're covered by a substitute. Something died, an innocent something died so that you can now come into my presence again and resume the relationship. So again, that's the means of salvation we find at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. Any questions on chapters 1, 2, and 3? Okay. Bert, in chapter 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, again, uh, prophesies. Cain and Abel, there, there's mul multitudes of level to what it's prophesying and talking about. We have Cain, the oldest child, right? Cain's the firstborn. Then we have Abel comes along afterwards. And we have Cain who is, who is seeking his own way to, to interact with God. And you have to read between the lines to understand that, yes, Cain and Abel both understand the way to approach God is through an innocent substitute, right? Because that's the offering that Abel brings. It tells us Abel brings the firstborn of his flock. Right? He brings the very best of the flock that he has to God and sacrifices the, the, flock, the best of his flock to God. So Abel did not produce the, the sheep. He did not produce the sheep. God produced the sheep. Abel was just the shepherd. Cain, on the other hand, brings the, the work of his own hand. Right? He, you know, I'm sure he's got a farm about like Terry's does. And so if Terry wanted to approach God, instead of coming through the blood of Jesus, he brings, uh, you know, a basket of radishes and onions and corn and tomatoes and all that stuff. He's br Cain brought the best he had, the best he had produced, his very best effort, and tried to offer that to God. And God says, that's not satisfactory. I don't accept that sacrifice, Cain, but Abel, I do. I'm pleased with Abel's sacrifice. Cain, I'm not pleased with yours. And that makes Cain angry. Angry with who? With himself for failing to do what God had told him to do, for failing to, to use the means that God had provided for that reconciliation to happen. No, he gets mad at Abel because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and he didn't accept Cain's sacrifice. What Cain failed to recognize is Abel is not bringing the works of his own hand. Abel is obeying God. God said it must be an innocent substitute. So that's what Abel brings. That's why God is pleased with Abel. And instead of, instead of repenting before God and saying, God, you're right, I'm sorry, I failed, and then provide the, the acceptable sacrifice, 
Cain kills Abel. Right? And we have that whole dynamic going on. The ultimate prophetic nature of that story is the children of Israel were trying to approach God in their own way by obeying and following the law of Moses. When Jesus comes on the scene and is reminding them that what you're saying is the law of Moses is not the law of Moses at all. You have misinterpreted and misapplied the law of Moses. You must come to the you must come to to God through the Messiah and through the suffering Messiah, through the Messiah's sacrifice, through God's lamb, from the, through the lamb of God and the children of Israel rather than repenting repenting of it before God and saying, yes, you're right, Jesus, we will come through you. No, they killed Jesus. They nailed him to a cross because they wanted to continue to try to approach God their own way. So the story of Cain and Abel is ultimately the story about mankind and Jesus when he comes and the nation of Israel and the hatred that the nation's uh, that the world has often had and still often has against Christianity and what we teach and what we preach because what we preach destroys human pride. When we teach uh, evangelical Christianity truly, it destroys human pride because there's nothing we can bring to God to impress him. And that most people will not accept that. They will not, they will not, they are not willing to say, you know what, I'm just as bad as everybody else. No, we desperately want to look at ourselves as better than others. And if we're better than other, then surely others, then surely God will accept us based on what we bring to the table. But that's not the case. We have to be totally humble. We have to, we have to, we have to agree with God. That's what repentance means. Fancy, the word behind the word repentance is is to see the same as. In the Greek, it's see the same as. We must see ourselves and our sin the same as God sees them. That's literally what the word means. So when we say we must repent, that means we must change our mind and see ourselves and see our sin in the same light that God sees it. So when we call it to repentance, that means, guys, you've got to put your own thoughts on the matter aside. You've got to, you've got to recognize that how God views this is how you must view this. And that must bring you to that sorrow and that willingness to turn away from. But the word literally means to see, to see the same as, to see the same, to see our sin the same way that God sees it. So that's, that's the story of Cain and Abel. Then we have the Abraham, Adam's descendants to Noah. And then we have the story of Noah and the flood. And there's a lot in Noah and the flood, but we're not going to get into that tonight. We can get into it sometime. Just understand it this way, that, that the ark, uh, was God's provided means, and the ark stands for Jesus. Has anybody ever been to the ark? Who's that Christian over there? Lily. Lily. Hi, Lily. Hi. And if you, if you ever go, if you're ever in northern Kentucky, uh, you can go to Creation Museum and go to the ark. Um, the ark was, I mean, when I first saw it, I knew intellectually how big it was but it's not until you actually are standing there looking up at it that you say wow you know because I, I've done the conversion in here okay I know how many feet it is how many feet tall and all that but it's not until you are standing right there at it that it is absolutely massive but it's it's a great time but I said all that to say and you don't even have to go there I'm sure you can go online to their websites and it'll lead you in all the ways that the ark prefigures Christ so Jenny you had your hand up did you want to say something no, I was pointing out a squirrel that's on our porch. Oh, <laughs> you'll be busy Washington. at my place. We got squirrels all over the joint. Um, so the ark is provided uh, as a means of rescue of Noah and his family. And one of the important things is that, that God shuts the ark. It's God himself who secures the ark. So when Noah and his family enter into the ark that God had provided through Noah, then God shuts them in and and preserves them. So, uh, and I'm sure we, we'll come back to that, I'm sure. 
and we have the, the story of the flood and, and the flood subsides and then chapter 10 uh, and then the story of Moses through chapter 9 and then the, or Noah through chapter 9 and then chapter 10 is the table of the nations and that's that boring part where so and so uh, these are the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog and all blah 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 and all of those that's called the table of the nations it explains to us when we get later in the scripture and even in the book of Revelations, when we when we went through and Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Gog Magog War. Well, we have to turn back to the Table of Nations to determine who those people are. Because we know where where Japheth's people travel. We know where Shem's people settle. We know where Ham's people settle. So we come back to Genesis chapter 10 to the Table of Nations to determine exactly who these nations are and where they come from and what they represent later on in the scripture. But going back to chapter 9, um, the story of Noah, Noah gets off the ark and he becomes a farmer and he plants a vineyard and he gets drunk and he's naked and, and, and his sons, Canaan, uh, one of his sons, Canaan, looks upon his father's nakedness. We don't know what all that means, right? It's just a euphemism of some sort, but Canaan is cursed. So Noah's son, Canaan, is cursed. But we have the cursing and the blessing of the sons. In Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse um, 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be uh, he shall he be to his shall he be to his brothers. And he also says this, and most ancient Jewish um, teachers the the Targums, uh, the Targum of John, Jehonathan, and many of the ancient Jewish commentators believe this is a messianic prophecy that the Messiah will come through the line of Shem. It's because in verse 26 he says, he, he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. He curses Canaan, he blesses Japheth, but when it comes to Shem, he blesses the Lord God of Japheth, of, of Shem. So that's an indication, it was an indication in ancient Jewish thought that this means the Messiah will come through the line of Shem, which is obviously what happened. Shem is the one who fathered all the Semitic people. Japheth is the one who uh, fathered all the, the um, Caucasian people and Asian people. And Canaan fostered the, the brown people, right? So, or fathered the brown people. Now, this is, and I know that people have pointed right back to this through the universe, I mean, through history, to reconcile their own racism, but that's not what it means at all. Just because they're a darker skin color does not mean they're inferior whatsoever, right? And this is not, not really addressing Canaan and all his people, what it is is just simple curse on Canaan. But we do see that God uses Shem uh, when they come back into the promised land to, to bring judgment on the Canaanites. But this is in no way, shape, or form uh, acceptable to be, to be used for racism. Because racism <coughs> is a great evil in God's eyes. Go read, go read the book of James. If you're discriminating on the basis of somebody's looks, what they look like, that's a great evil in God's eyes. Chapter 11, we have the story of the Tower of Babel. And this is where the nations, and this is where we get the various nations, and the various nations are, are dispersed. The Tower of Babel was all about dispersing mankind to ultimately obey what God had told Noah and his sons to do. Go forth and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, they weren't doing that. They were staying all together and the dispersal happens at the Tower of Babel. Chapter 12 is where we get it, is the break in the book, because chapters 1 through 11 has all about been about the history of mankind up to this point. The focus shifts in chapter 12 and starts drilling down in onto the lineage of the Messiah. He's going to come from Abraham through Jacob, I mean, through Isaac, and then Jacob, who's named Israel. And then we see later on, we have to prophesy that he's going to come through Judah and so on and so forth. So the rest of the story is about the patriarchs and Joseph. 
Joseph is not typically named with the patriarchs. When you say the patriarchs, you just it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, a, majority, a large majority of the rest of Genesis is ultimately about Joseph, who was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I think we'll probably stop right there and get into the story of Abraham next week, or Abram. Comments, questions? I told you it's going to be more of a survey. Tonight, anyhow. Next week, not so much. You'll need pen and paper next week. I'm joking. You can if you want to, though. This might be a little bit of a silly question, but where would um, Cain have gotten an offering? If he was a farmer, what could he have offered? Well, uh, every animal around there was tame. He just walk up to one of them. Like, right here, I got a squirrel to offer. So why, why did um, Abel, why was he a shepherd then? Like, why did he have to watch out? watch out for animals or... well at, at that at that time they were not uh, meat eaters they were vegetarians right so i would imagine that he's he's it's for the wool right i mean they're learning to domesticate the animals so for the wool but and plus he could have went to he could have went to abel and said hey i'll give you a you know a bushel of potatoes for a I need, a, I need a lamb for a sacrifice. Can I buy one from you? Can I get one from you? So I've never had that question come up, but it's not a stupid question. It's, it's not a silly question. It's a good question. So, I mean, we don't know the dynamics of the, the animal and man relationship after the, after the fall, because this was after the fall. So, and we all know the creation deteriorated after the fall, but... Uh, so the animals may have been afraid of, of mankind then. And so they learned to domesticate, but they weren't eating them. So it would have been for the milk, for the cheese, uh, and for the, the wool. So in the beginning, they, di they didn't eat meat. It wasn't until after the flood. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Flood. We, and we specifically see that as we'll go and we look, we'll look at the flood a little next week and see what the consequences of the flood was. But that does not mean that, we, that God wants us to be vegetarians now. Jesus ate meat. We still have them pig feet, Ashley. And unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. <laughs> they had leavened bread. It was just an eleven on their, on their, on their certain things. Anything else?